Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We're going to spend some time today talking about uh, ways to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Um, we're in challenging, challenging times. I was talking about, uh, to Ms. Faye about one of our missionaries, Sarah Bradley, has come off the field. And um, I, I, I feel her pain and anguish of um, worrying, what are people going to think? You know, are they going to think of me about you know, quitter? And then sometimes you you get alone, you start self-doubting yourself. But was I really supposed to go there? And why would God start something and not finish something? And there's all kinds of things you're thinking and you're struggling. And so self-care is very, very important. And so you got to go back to your priorities. Why do you do what you do? Why, what motivates you, who guides you, and who should you listen to for encouragement and guidance? And ultimately, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, because we belong to the Lord. And so uh, Mark chapter 12, look at verse 18, and we'll get the whole context of why Jesus said what he said. Mark chapter 18, verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 18, if I can get it straight. Then come unto him the Sadducees which say there is no resurrection, and they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed, and the second took her, and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise, the seven had her, and left no seed, last of all, the woman died also. You talk about it, struggles. I mean, um, not just for the family, but for for the wife, for the first husband. And so they, she passed away. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do not ye therefore err, because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And so basically we that were married now, <laughs> when it comes to listen and I are marriage, um, that the moment that she passed away, she's up in heaven, I'm down here. And so when we meet again, we will no longer be Mr. and Mrs. Fryer. She'll be Lucinda and I'll be Jim. The Bible says we shall know as we are known. Will I recognize her? Yes, I will. Will she recognize me? Yes, she will. So once, once we leave this earth, we go to heaven. There's only one marriage up in heaven. That's where we, as the bride of Christ, marry our groom, Jesus Christ. And so we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We get to heaven. So that's what Jesus is trying to say to try to explain to him the Sadducee. Of course, the reason why he's sad is because he didn't believe in the resurrection. And so, and so it's right there. And in touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. That's Mark chapter 12, verse 27. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You're, therefore, you do greatly err. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? He was always dealing with these people, trying to trick him. And Jesus answering said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And so this is in conjunction with this. So Jesus is saying, this is the first commandment, but this is not separate. They tie together. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor. And he, this is the how we're supposed to love our neighbors as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, well, master, Thou hast said the truth. Of course he told the truth. <laughs> he is the truth. For there is, there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart. Now notice what the scribe saying. 
And the Lord says something very interesting as we get further down this portion of scripture. But there's one God, there's none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And he's saying what we are when we are loving the Lord our God with every part of our life and loving our neighbor, that is more important than the acts of offerings. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, now look at what the Lord says to him. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. He said, you're this close. You are this close from the kingdom of God. And no man after that does ask him any question. And so the aspect of loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength is, is important. Now, when, you, when he says that you're this close to the kingdom of God, who was it in the book of Acts who said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? Wasn't it Agrippa or Herod, wasn't it? Either Agrippa or Herod, I can't remember which one of those two were. But the fact is, is that, okay, I know it was one of those two guys. And um, so Paul is preaching and, and he's, um, this, you're this close. And the fact is, is it important to, to love people and love God? Yes, it is. But there's got to be a reason why we do what we do. There's got to be a motor behind that. And so I've talked to a lot of people, and they, they know that this says you're supposed to love God with everything you have, and you're supposed to love people. That's important. Because if more people would just do those two things, I think we'd have a better society, don't you? I think we'd have a, a happier society, uh, a less uh, confrontational, hurtful society, if we love God first and love people secondly as ourselves. And so with this, we've got to understand is that if we're going to do that, and the Bible is just not for our reading, but it's for our practicing. And yet some say, well, why should I practice? I don't understand why I'm supposed to do what I do. I know um, from the time that I came to know Christ the Savior, and uh, there are a lot of things I had to learn um, as what, what, what is a Christian supposed to do? What is a Christian not supposed to do? And why I do it? What is my motive? If we're doing it for the wrong motive, then when something comes up, then we can get bitter, we can get angry, we can even quit. Kind of like the illustration I talked about. Um, one missionary went to a um, bush people and went in there and uh, started preaching. And then the, the, the bush people said, what are we supposed to do? And he said, I want you to bring all of your idols right here, and we're going to have a great big old idol burning session because you don't need them, you need God. Of course, they were all hyped up and excited about the mystery, telling them what to do. And then they had this big idol burning thing, and everything was great for a while, but then something happened that the, the bush people didn't understand why God would allow certain things to happen and didn't understand what the missionary was trying to say, so they got mad. When they got mad, what did they do? They went back to those idols. Why? Because they were doing it for the missionary's sake, not doing it because they knew it was right for them to do. A little bit later, missionary felt called to go there, and the one missionary that had to leave because of utter failure uh, said, you don't want to know anything about idols because you do that, uh, they're going to really get upset at you. And so the missionary said, I'm going to go there and just let God lead. So he did and taught the Bible and uh, never said anything about burning anything or getting rid of it. He just let the word of God speak. And after about a year and a half, two years, the, the chief of the, the Bush people said, um, I just want to let you know what you have done. You have literally changed our people. Why? All of us have gotten rid of our idols that we took back after that first missionary came. Now we've gotten rid of it, not because you told us to do it, because God talked to us on an individual basis. And that's the aspect of our Christianity. We don't do things to satisfy people. We do things to please the Lord, period. 
You do what you do to please the Lord. And if some people don't understand it, oh, well. That's kind of like with Sarah having to come off the field. I can guarantee it because we dealt with that too, is that churches and pastors and friends and people in the ministry and things like that literally just, just guilted us about, why would you leave the mission field? Why would you quit serving Jesus? Well, I never quit serving Jesus. God just gave me a different mission field. And they're expecting us to explain to them, which we ourselves didn't completely understand. It's like they put themselves up on some sort of a pedestal like we had to be accountable to them and not to God. Well, we were wise enough as we were older, we just got to and said, you know what? You have any problem with what God told us to do? Pick up the phone and talk to God. He's the one that told us what to do, and we did it. We don't understand everything. We didn't even like what what was happening. I enjoyed going to different churches. I enjoyed being in different ministries. I enjoyed talking about Brazil. I enjoyed talking about Espiritu Santo. I talked about uh, Victoria, which is the capital of the state of Espiritu Santo, which is which was founded by Italian settlers. And we love the fact that there's so many children involved in that, in that city of Victoria, and it's Espiritu Santo. And we loved the fact that we're going to go to start an orphanage. And we're going to work with kids. We found out that AIDS and other type of diseases are out there, that if we would have got there, we found that later, that if we would have gotten there, Lucinda had such a low tolerance because of certain type of diseases, she may not have come back to the States. She might have just passed away because it was so bad. We didn't know that. Did I break our heart? Yes. But we had communication with other missionaries in that area, and so we kept the communication, and we do what we could to keep the, the focus on there's people out there that need to know the Lord. And I think it was, let's see, we left the Missionary Deputation Trail in 1990. Worked at a church for four months. We got laid off. Can you imagine just starting working for a church, and then you get laid off because the finances get really tight? We are just outside of St. Louis. And we have several members that work for TWA. See, what's TWA? TWA is now a bankrupt airline that was based out of St. Louis. A lot of our members work for that. And so a lot of the money that they would give to the church wasn't there because they got laid off themselves. And so the pastor said, we're going to have to let you go. So we went to Chinook. And that's where the pastor said, you're only going to be here for a little while. You're going to go start a church. What? I didn't come. I didn't sign up to go start a church. I came here to work in yours. And just different things. And. You know, we were there for a little bit, then went out to Atwood and started that church and then health problems. The doctor said, either you leave, you're going to die because of the, the conditions of the weather out there. Northern Virginia, we are there, went down to Southern Virginia, back to Northern Virginia, down to Homestead, Florida, Homestead, Florida, Pit, to Pittsburgh, Kansas. Why God bounced us all over, I have no idea. All I know is that when God stirred our hearts, we got the right type of counsel, we prayed, we followed. Some ministries were wonderful. Some were tough. Some were challenging. But in all of it, we knew exactly what we were, where we were supposed to be. I know that I'm supposed to be in Pittsburgh, Kansas right now, like I knew about it when I first came here in, in January of 2004. I know this was supposed to be at this particular time. I know that. I'm thankful for that. And so has it always been uh, sunshine and roses? No, because life happens, doesn't it? You have health issues, you have financial issues, you have societal issues, you have job issues, all kinds of issues, and you've got to learn to deal with it. God never promised that every part of a Christian life was going to be perfect. He just said, I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. And to us, that's what gets us through. And so you've got to realize First and foremost, that you do what you do for the cause of Christ to please the Lord as God directs you, period. Whether people like it or get upset at you or whatever. But you've got to do what you do because ultimately when we pass on, we're going to stand before Jesus and Jesus is going to say, give account of your life. Now, as a pastor, not only give an account of my life, but I'm going to give an account of, of the church's life while I'm here. So from January 2004 until whatever time God should take me home, 
that uh, I'm going to be accountable about everything that happens inside this church. I would like to say in 20 years, I made perfect decisions. Some I haven't. Some I thought, man, those are stupid decisions. But I made them and we live with them. And I will stand accountable to that regarding the finances, the missionaries, how we took care of the church. I'm going to stand accountable. So as a pastor, I stand before Jesus. What I preached, all those different things. And so loving the Lord has got to be a personal decision. You cannot be guilted into doing that. You can't be forced to do that. You've got to be willing to do that because you want to express your feelings. You want to express your gratitude for the relationship that you have. I will say that I'm closer to the Lord now than what I was a year ago. And my love for the Lord has grown. But it's been through trials. And been through struggles. And so, but when Jesus told that scribe, hey, you're, you're just about where you need to be, but you're not there. Almost thou persuades me to be a Christian. There are people out there that are doing their best to love the Lord, but they don't completely understand why do they do that? Or what, how can I get to that point where I get over the hump to where I feel like I'm being successful. Well, look at um, 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. you got to look at what is love from a biblical perspective. You see, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, thy strength. Is that you've got to say, what is love? In the Greek, which was most of the New Testament was written, or all the New Testament was written, Old Testament was written in um, Hebrew and, and the book of Daniel, some Aramaic. When you look at the Greek when it's originally written, there are three basic terms for love. You have phileo love, that is brotherly kindness. That is a love you have for a friend or even for a spouse or a co-worker or church when you look at the word love. Then you have eros, which is a which is a, um, a physical love between a husband and a wife. Then you have the love that we're looking at. It's called agape love. That is godly love. That is beyond. That transcends every boundary out there. It cannot be limited to a person or to an organization or to a particular event. Agape love is all encompassing. And so we look at 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 1, and it says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. When you think about how much love God has shown to us, he says, Behold, wake up, God's done a lot for you. He has given you so much love, he says, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Now go to chapter 4, look at verses 9 and 10. Chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. <coughs> well, you know, look at verse 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. A person cannot truly exhibit or understand agape love without a relationship with God. Then it says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's agape love. That is a self, that is a sacrificing love. That's the first exhibition of love shown to us. Then it says this, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So it says, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And so if we've had God's love shown to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've accepted it, then it is our job to be a channel and share that same love to other people. And so when you dig about looking at godly love, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which was commonly known as the love chapter. Whenever I perform a wedding, I will read portions of 1 Corinthians chapter 13.
Look at verses 4 and following says this. Charity or agape love suffers long. Godly love will put up with a whole lot more than what we, we think we should. Suffers long and is kind. I've told you when I pastored down in South Florida and I was preaching about this portion of scripture and I preached about God, love is kind. A lady literally left the church, a Sunday school teacher left the church because her remarks was, Christians shouldn't be kind, they should be loving. How can you how can you be kind without the example of what love is? And she literally got some folks stirred up because kindness sometimes is not associated with some Christians. Kind, love is kind. Then it says this envieth not. Love isn't jealous. Charity bondeth not itself, is not puffed up. Godly love does not build oneself up, up, it builds other people up. It doth not behave itself unseemly. Godly love, which is based upon the character of God, does not act outside of the character of God. Seeketh not her own, which means they don't, godly love is not manipulative. It's not easily provoked, which means you can't just say, well, I hate you now. I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you. And like some of my kids on my bus. It was what I saw in Bible college that that's why that's why when, when I determined that whenever I went into a relationship with a woman, that I did was never gonna tell her I loved her until I was willing to put the ring on her finger. Why? Because you start throwing that word love around, it starts messing with people's minds. They start going crazy. And then pretty soon something happens, then you see that same couple which is in love. All of a sudden, hating each other, not looking at each other, talking bad about each other, and walking away. And just, that's crazy. That's not love. That's provoking not itself. That is, thinketh no evil. Vengeance. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Godly love does not see someone struggle and say, you deserve that. Rejoice in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, or godly love, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now go to the last portion of scripture. Verse 13 says this. And now abide the faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, he's not saying that that's, that's the only thing we need to have because having faith is important. And having hope is important. But if you have the, the, the list of priorities, so godly love is where it all starts. Because it's from the heart of love that God gave that God gave to us by Jesus dying on the cross, we have hope and we have faith. Without God's love, we have nothing. And so we're looking at loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and mind, our strength. We've got to understand from a biblical perspective. But then also, if we're going to do that from a biblical perspective, we need to have someone to be able to explain it or guide us. Now, who did God give to us to guide us into all truth? The Holy Spirit. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The Holy Spirit, which is the third part of the, of, the, of the Trinity, which is just as much God as Jesus, so much as God, as God the Father. And so we look at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Look at verses 22 and 23. We see it says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. The greatest of these is love. And so the fruit or the evidence of the Spirit of God is able to love. And some, I'll be honest with you, there's some people that are hard to love. Would you agree with me on that? Sometimes it's better to love them from a distance than not love them at all. 
And you've got to be discreet about that. There's no reason, as they say, poke the bear. So, by the way, I still love you anyway. But godly love, it says love. And then it says, in continue verse 22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lust. We live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And so we're going to walk in the spirit. We allow him to guide us. We allow him to teach us. We allow him to mold us. We allow him to direct us to understand what love is. Now, when you talk to people uh, on the street, you ask them, what is love? You're probably going to get a different answer from 100 different people. So how can we have godly love? We have to have someone that's going to speak with one voice, with a consistency that can only come from God himself. God is love. And when Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, see, we can't even love God right. We can't love people right. We can't even love ourselves right. Say, oh my goodness, isn't that idolatry of loving yourself? No. We have to take care of ourselves, don't we? We have hygiene. We have to take care of showers and other stuff like that. That's loving yourself. Y'all have clothes on. That's a good thing. That's loving yourself. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I hate to get down to the, to the brass tacks, but you know what? We do things to love ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. So if we're going to love, love people like we love ourselves, the same care that we look towards taking care of ourselves, we love other people. Once again, there's some, there's some things about myself that, man, that's horrible. And so with that, there's some, there's some people say, you know what? I'm going to love you anyway because God tells me to love you. And it may be a struggle, but I'm not going to say what it, what's in my little brain. I'm still going to love you because that's what Jesus wants me to do. Is that a struggle sometimes? Yes, it is, because we have been taught in our society to speak first and deal with the consequences later. But you've got to love God first. How are we supposed to love God? We've never seen him. We've never touched him. We have the book. We have the book. We have the spirit of God. We have faith. But how can we love God? We've never actually experienced him. We have to have someone to guide us. It's like an introduction. And the only one that can introduce, introduce us to God would be the spirit of God because he lives within us. And so we go to the biblical perspective. And then we also understand we've got to acknowledge our dependence on the Holy Spirit. And so, number one, we've got to, love, it's a, we've got to have a biblical perspective about love is. And then we've got to understand that we have to have a dependence on the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. Then we're supposed to love the Lord with all our heart. Look at Galatians, I mean Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Much of the New Testament is the Old Testament rewritten. Which tells us there's a continuity here from Old Testament and New Testament, and there are no contradictions whatsoever, none of that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at verses 4 and 5, says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And, so he's telling the adults, you've got to love the Lord with every part of your life. Then he says, now let's add to this. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee in the land which he swear to thy fathers 
to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give thee great and good, goodly cities which thou buildest not. And so he's saying that you love God as parents, then you transfer to your children. We have a society today of children that don't know God. We have a, we have a generation where kids have no idea. I, I can't tell you how many kids have on different buses I've driven or even as a foster parent have said, what's church? I've heard it's a bad place to be. I'm not going to go there. See, because they, that's all they hear. I've had kids say, I'm not going to church. Well, I'm sorry, you can't, live in my, you can't be in my house now. That's my house rule. And when I had that Wiccan girl come in, she said, church, you mean like Bible church? Said, well, it's kind of like a Bible church. It's Baptist, but pretty close. And she said, I'm not going to no church. She said, you, and the worker said, you have to go because you have to be in his vision. I said, I'll let you sit in the hallway. I'll let you sit in one of those classrooms. But you got to be on the property here because that's a rule that I have. Well, I said, you're not going to burn up. I promise you. There's, <laughs> we got asbestos everywhere, so you're going to be fine. And when she said, what's, what's asbestos? Chris, a lot of young kids have no idea. And so she sat back in that seat back, one of the seats back there and listened. Never ascribed to even believe anything. When I saw her a few months ago, she made sure that she saw me, made me sure I got a chance to talk to her son, which is autistic and deaf and mute. This is the boy you've been praying for who just had major heart surgery. And he's up and about because I believe you prayed for him. And she's Wiccan, still Wiccan. What happened? And I never preached at her. We never had Bible studies at the house with her being involved. The Spirit of God has a, a wonderful way that once he gets into our people's minds, he starts working on them. And they can't get mad at the preacher, he can't get mad at the church, if you're laying on your bed and a Bible verse comes popping up, where'd that come from? And they dismiss it, but pretty soon they start thinking about it. That's the significance of living the right type of life and letting God take care of the rest. Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but it's God that gives the increase. That was one thing that when I was thinking about with Sarah Bradley having to live and leave the mission field, I know Lucinda and I, we never made it to the foreign mission field. But our thought was, what's going to happen to all those people over there that we may not be able to meet? And God told us, you just plant the seed where I tell you to plant it. And you let me take care of the harvest and quit worrying about it. that's not your job. Okay. What about the people in Brazil? I still talk to people in Brazil. And every chance I go to Pitt State, I meet Brazilians. I talk to them all the time. Plant the seed. That's all. I, that might be the only thing I ever do. At International Festival last month, and I met two students that were one was from from uh, Rio de Janeiro, and one was from a, a state north of that in a town called Bahia, which is right along the coast. And I said, "You ever heard of?" And I knew they would because uh, everyone knows about uh, Espiritu Santo, which in Portuguese means Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, we know all about that, that state. And Victoria and about the fish markets. And those Italians, they love to cook Portuguese food with a little bit of twinge of Italian. And we just talked about it. I was just like, wow. But it made their day for someone to be able to say, you know what? I know where you're from. I can relate with you. When you're 2,000 miles away and someone says something about that you can relate with, it perks you up a little bit. And I'm sure that Sarah is feeling bad because she feels like she's a failure. You're not a failure if you do what God tells you to do. You're just not a failure. But we put too much pressure on ourselves. He says you're supposed to love me with all your heart. He doesn't say you're supposed to do all these great works and everything and expect, put so much expectation on yourself that you forget I'm the one that builds up and I'm the one that tears down. Love the Lord with all our heart. When we talk about the heart, we believe it's the center of our emotions. But in the Jewish culture, it is the center of the will. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, 
Proverbs chapter 4. And I've talked about that when I talked about that in a study a couple, a couple about a month or two ago. I talked about the center of your life, but it's also the center of your will, which is the deepest part of your life. That's where all of our um, attitudes, that's where our um, desires come from. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. <coughs> verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We can think of the heart as the place of our spiritual life, our thoughts, our feelings, our motivations, our reasoning and understanding. Our decisions, our morals, and our will come from that. So loving the Lord God with all of our heart is to have a strong desire and will towards him, which means he's my focus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now set at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Consider him. So if I'm going to love the Lord, my, my God, with all my heart, it means I have such a relationship with him that he is my ultimate focus and everything I'm going to do is to please him is to make sure that I'm doing what he is happy with. That's the start of it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. When you talk about all, it means everything. And that's where we start at. And that's what we'll stop at for this morning. We'll talk more about it during the 11 o'clock service. But it's amazing when you're looking at, we're told what we're supposed to do, but many times we're not, we don't have it explained to us how to do it. Now, I've always had a philosophy with any type of job that I had. You hire me, number one, you don't have to babysit me. Give me what you want. Give me how you want it to be done. Give me the tools so I can be successful. If there's any time frames, give me the time frames. If that's all it is, then get out of my way and let me do it. If I'm doing something wrong, correct me. But my job is to make sure I do my job the best of my abilities. Because with my job, it's just not the employer, but ultimately, it's God that gave me that job. So I want to please him. And that's the great thing about serving the Lord is that he'll let us know. We serve a great God. And he's so gracious to us too, isn't he? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Bless us. So go in the morning worship service. Speak to hearts. We love you, dear Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. The service started about 15 minutes. You are dismissed.